Before introducing our speaker, I would like to remind you that ARISC is an American overseas research center that supports research in and about Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, both in the South Caucasus and the US. A member of the Council of American Overseas Research Centers, KEORG, ARISC offers fellowships, programming, and research support. I now have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Rebecca Mitchell, a recipient of the America of ARISC Junior Research Fellowship. This fellowship is supported with a grant from the US Department of Education. Dr. Mitchell is an assistant professor of history at Middlebury College, where she has taught since 2016. She completed her PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in uh, 2011. Her first book, Nietzsche's Orphans, Music, Metaphysics, and Twilight of the Russian Empire, uh, examines the interrelationship between imperial identity, nationalist tensions, philosophical ideals, and musical life in the final years of the Russian Empire. It received the 2016 uh, W. Bruce Lincoln Book Prize for the Association of, uh, for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Uh, her new book project, Discordant Empire, Music, Belief, and Identity, Identity in Imperial Russia uses religious music as a lens through which to explore the complex connections between religious, ethnic, national, and imperial identities in Petersburg, Moscow, Kazakh, and Tbilisi. Please join me in round of virtual applause to welcome Dr. Mitchell. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, the floor is yours, um, uh, please. Okay, so is my PowerPoint full screen now? Yes, Excellent. it is. So um, I'd just like to start um, with uh, a word of thanks to um, ERISC for supporting this research this summer. Um, and then a couple of caveats in regard to the material I'm presenting. Um, first of all, of course, due to travel restrictions, I have not been able to travel myself to Tbilisi this summer to work in the archives. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have the assistance of a research um, fellow there who has been working on my behalf in the archives, um, but this of course has uh, slowed the process down considerably. Um, so what you're going to hear today is material that I've been able to gain at this point in time. There's a lot more stuff that I'm still in the process of looking at. And then tied in with that, this is very much a work in progress. And so I'm very excited to hear feedback on any portion of this larger project. All right, so. Let's see if I can actually make my screen change. Okay. In February 1901, the censorship committee of the Moscow Synodal School of Church Singing approved a new liturgical setting by the composer Nikolai Klinovsky for publication and performance. Um, and the approval of the Synodal School basically meant that this work could be used both in liturgical services and um, in performance spaces. And the work quickly gained popularity. Already in spring of that year, the Synodal Choir had performed large portions of the work several times at Uspensky Sabor in the Moscow Kremlin. Most unusual in this particular instance was not the high level of praise that was lavished on the composition by the censorship committee, but the fact that the liturgy was based not on Russian, but on Georgian chant. A graduate of the Moscow Conservatory, Klinovsky had been appointed director of the Tiflis Imperial Music Society in 1894. And it was while he lived in Tiflis that he became interested in Georgian folk music. Uh, and this is a quote from Klinovsky. Amid my studies of the music ethnography of Georgians, I particularly studied church singing, interesting in its scale and original cadences. Klinovsky saw it as his task to, quote, find those knowledgeable of the ancient church singing passed down to our days, not falsified and not spoiled by new things, and to give these melodies harmonic development fitting their own scales, end quote. So by publishing the liturgy with both Georgian and church Slavonic texts, Klinovsky intended to, quote, give Georgian chant the possibility to become the inheritance of the Russian Orthodox Church, as are Bulgarian, Greek, and other chants." End quote. Now, Klinovsky's liturgy quickly drew the attention of a composer named Nikolai Kompanyski, who was a supporter of the so-called New Direction in Orthodox Church Music, which was a compositional school based primarily in Moscow, that similarly to what Klinovsky was trying to do, emphasized the 
importance of uncovering the true nature of ancient Russian chant. And so it was natural that Kompanyevsky would find uh, Klinovsky's work interesting. In an article written for the leading musical periodical of the day, the Russian musical newspaper, Kompanyevsky welcomed the inclusion of Georgian chant into the Russian liturgy. One must wonder, he fretted, why our church singing books published by the Holy Synod to this day are not enriched with the chants of Georgian and other Orthodox churches, Serbian, Romanian, Bulgarian, Greek. Indeed, beginning with its first edition of these books in 1772 to the present, they not only have not been expanded with new chants, but have even been shortened, end quote. And in addition to its emphasis on the importance of purifying ancient chant uh, from undue European influence, Kompanyevsky demonstrated a belief um, in his article that the shared universality underpinning orthodoxy was embodied specifically in its chant tradition. And so he believed that the Russian Orthodox Church could only be enriched through the inclusion of other chants developed by various national traditions rooted in a shared ancient um, her heritage. So basically he has this um, assumption that the chant traditions of all Orthodox churches are ultimately um, derived from Byzantium, but have undergone their own unique national development. And so that by bringing them together at this point in time, you will really have this sort of multi-ethnic um, celebration of the true faith. Kompanyevsky's warmth, however, did not extend to the three-voice transcription that had served as Klinovsky's ethnographic basis. And for those of you who can read music, that is the um, example that is on the screen um, in front of you. Uh, Kompanyevsky actually dismissed the harmonization offhand, insisting that chants could only be monophonic in nature, and concluded that the three-part setting was nothing more than, quote, the product of innovation, of fashion, carried to Georgia at the beginning of the last century by Russian singers, and that it was no different than the harmonies of Lvov and Bakhmetov. Um, and for a composer devoted to overturning what he considered to be the foreign, Polish, and Catholic influence that had come into the Russian Orthodox Church through the works of people like Lvov and Bakhmetov um, in earlier generations, this connecting of Klinovsky with their musical style was um, devastating. But one of the things I want to draw attention to here is that uh, Kompanyevsky's underlying assumption that the polyphonic nature of the original source um, could not be accurate um, was a pretty clear indication of his lack of knowledge of um, Georgian polyphonic tradition. Um, and so what I wanted to do at this point, just to give you sort of a sound in your head to be thinking about as we talk about the Georgian sacred chant revival, is play you an example of um, a Georgian sacred chant, which you will hear first, in three-part polyphonic harmony, which is um, a traditional form that existed in Georgia at this time. And so you can imagine, uh, Kompanyevsky thinks all chant has to be monophonic, and so um, for him, this is um, something that's uh, completely unimaginable. So this is the Georgian example. stop it there just for time reasons. And then the other thing I wanted to do for those of you who are less familiar um, with sacred music tradition is give you an example of the style of music that Kompanyevsky was arguing against. So what I'm going to play right now is an example of um, a setting by Bortniansky. And if you listen to the harmonic um, sounds in each case, you will notice that they are very different. And these different sounds are really at the base of um, discussions around the Georgian sacred chant revival.
hate to break that off in the middle, but I think it's just to give you a sense of the different kinds of sounds that we're talking about here. Now, what you just heard was also not the style that Kompanyski or the New Direction in Orthodox Church music was calling for. Um, they believed this showed too much influence from Western Italian um, harmonic style. And so they were interested in reviving ancient chant and then deriving harmonies that would be more appropriate to that style. Um, and so um, Kampanyski's assumption then that Georgian sacred chant should also begin from the monophonic basis um, was at the root of his argument. But Kampanyski's underlying assumption that the polyphonic nature of the original source proved its inaccuracy was quickly disputed by a number of letters to the editor. Um, and the source of the transcription was soon identified by the daughter of the fellow had done, who had done it, a man named Mrevlov. Um, and she gave the background of where this uh, transcription actually had come from. In 1841, the head of Shuam Monastery, um, you, you have a picture of it there, the Archimandrit Safroni, who had been a great admirer of Georgian church song, had requested his acquaintance, Mrevlov, a talented musician familiar both with local chanting practices as well as Western musical notation, to do a transcription of the Georgian service, stating, quote, our Georgian singing begins to slowly decline. It has moved towards a path of innovation and um, uh, decline. Write it down before it isn't too late. Well, we old men are still living who know our old church song given to us by our grandfathers. And here you can hear a few themes, right? Of sort of decline and the need to preserve um, a tradition that is under threat by uh, modern innovations. And um, Mrevlov's daughter further vouched for the authenticity of this three-part transcription based on her own status as an ethnic Georgian, to whom she said the music immediately spoke in a way that um, Western harmonizations did not. So she said, you know, this is a great example of pure Georgianness because when I hear it, I feel myself to be um, uh, moved in a way that Western music does not. Um, now, a somewhat different response was offered by Dmitry Arakchiev or Dmitry Arakashvili, who was a Georgian musician and ethnographer who had recently relocated to Moscow. Though he also valued the ethnographic source for um, information it might provide, he attacked Klinovsky's transcription as erasing all particularities of Georgian chant. He said, basically, you know, he's just turned this into um, the same kind of Russian music that we hear all the time in the liturgical uh, services. Um, and this accusation was in turn refuted by one of the censors from the Synodal School who had approved the work and who was also a composer, a man named Alexander Kostalski. Um, I could go on and on about the sort of back and forth dispute that emerged, but rather get in, than getting into the details of this discussion, what I want, want to highlight is that all of the participants actually agreed um, on the inherently national attributes that were embodied in Georgian sacred chant and the importance of preserving them. Um, they just couldn't agree on what exactly those were. Um, and they also agreed on the idea that the chants were a spiritual treasure, not just to the Georgian nation, but to all Orthodox believers. And so in this debate, we see um, issues of modernity, of identity, both imperial identity, Orthodox identity, also national identity, um, and empire all intertwined. And so studies of music in Russian history have tended to focus primarily on the question of national identity, um, even when it's been problematized by scholars like uh, Richard Taruskin or Marina Frolova Walker, who have looked at Russian identity as something that is constructed rather than inherent. And so what I want to do in my new project is um, Instead, formu instead uh, formulate music in a different way, um, looking at it as a lens towards understanding complex interactions within the imperial space. And one of the reasons I focused on religious music in particular is because it does almost immediately offer these multiple possible levels of identity, both as a unifying orthodox identity, but also very specific national uh, traditions that emerge in connection to the chants. And um, the talk I'm giving right now is part of a larger book project, and I've just um, given for you sort of a 
breakdown of the chapters of that larger project as they appear right now. Um, it's basically a series of case studies on the revival or construction, depending on the phrasing you want to use, uh, of religious mu music in different regions of the empire. And it touches upon issues of orthodox unity, missionary activity, nationalist or separatist tendencies, um, all within the context of a modernizing empire. So for instance, chapter one is really looking at sort of philosophical understandings of the role of music within orthodox um, thinking. Chapter two looks at the role of music in conversion, particularly focused in the region of Kazan and the work of composer Stepan Smolensky with baptized Tatar children. Um, chapter three looks at Moscow and um, this revival of pure Russian chant, which is kind of where we started our talk today. And then chapter four goes into looking at the Georgian sacred chant revival um, within this larger context. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about that larger project um, in the Q&A if anyone um, has questions at that point in time. But for time reasons, I'd like to move forward um, and just say, you know, in terms of today's talk, scholars of Georgian chant um, have done really excellent work in recent years um, in explicating the unique traditions of this art form and also in working towards preserving it for the future. Um, and it's understandable that this, of course, has been the main focus of Georgian chant scholarship, um, given the pressure that was placed on all forms of religious music in the Soviet period, as well as Georgia's um, post-Soviet um, quest to redefine itself in the modern age. And it's to the credit of these devoted artists and scholars. Um, I actually saw that John Graham, who is one of the scholars whose work I draw on extensively, is here today. Um, it's to their credit that Georgian polyphony now occupies a privileged space in the country's heritage and um, understandings of Georgianness. But the story that I want to tell in my work is a little bit different. Um, so I ask instead what role the multi-ethnic fabric of the Russian Empire um, of institutional concerns or bureaucratic systems played in decisions regarding acceptable and unacceptable forms of church singing. So sort of bringing empire back into our understanding of um, religious music. So when we look at um, the history of Georgia within the Russian Empire, um, we really start um, in practical terms with the Russian annexation of uh, Kartli Kaheti in 1801, which initiated a long process of incorporation of the territory into imperial Russian state structures. And the map that you see in front of you is just um, a, an example of the uh, Caucasus Viceroyalty, which was the actual political um, breakdown in uh, the imperial period. And a similar process followed in relation to the church. On January 30th, 19, 1811, Alexander I confirmed the decision by the Holy Synod by which the autocephalous status of the Georgian church, which had been granted by the Antioch church in the fifth century was abolished. Um, Anton II uh, lost his title of Catholicos Patriarch and was exiled to Russia, while an exarch was appointed as um, head of the Georgian exarchate. Um, and with the expansion of uh, the Russian Empire in the Caucasus region, the exarchate actually came to include much of the Transcaucasus uh, territory. Um, and so the Georgian exarch actually had power over both Russians who were settle settled in the area, as well as Georgians and anyone else who um, was a member of the Orthodox Church. And I think it's worth noting, um, if you look at the map here, the blue boundaries show you what the um, actual territory of the Georgian exarchate was. It's worth noting that it incorporated the entire region of the Caucasus, including modern day Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. And this is a story that's often told in terms of Russification, which um, is an important aspect of this, but there was also a bureaucratic um, sort of imperial rationale behind the union. Um, by getting rid of the autocephalous nature of the Georgian Orthodox Church, it actually brought it more in line with the Russian Orthodox Church, which itself did not have a patriarch, but was under the control of the Holy Synod. Um, now, the big question, of course, is uh, for my work, what did this mean for Georgian chant? 
Though early pneumatic forms of musical notation exist, Georgian chant was primarily an oral tradition prior to Russian annexation. And master chanters would pass on their knowledge to students in monasteries or seminaries. And singing style varied quite a bit depending on the region of the, the singers. And with the arrival of the Russian state, the Georgian chant style was gradually replaced by chanting in church Slavonic from musical notes. Um, and this is often framed as a form of imperialism, but it also had very strong civilizational overtones. And one great example of this is a quote from um, Prince Pavel Tsitsianov, who was the governor general of Georgia in 1802 in a letter he wrote to the Catholicos, Antony II, um, before he was removed, in which he stated, quote, in churches here, Georgian singing resembles the bleating of a goat and it is better to teach Kievan notes, end quote. And when the Tiflis Seminary opened uh, in restructured form in 1817 under the Exarch Philophylact, it included a class specifically in Slavonic singing, nothing in Georgian singing. Um, but according to a later account, quote, in seeing the coldness of the students to this education in Slavonic singing, and particularly the wildness, the dikost of their voices, the whole, most holy ex ordered the class closed. As a result of this experience, it was concluded that in the Georgian church, no one with an educated ear likes Georgian oral singing. Um, and so you can see how there is this very strong sort of educative um, imperialist and also civilizational aspect. And so one of the things I'm trying to answer in my work in the archives is um, to figure out when and where Russian singing actually replaced Georgian singing in various regions and what the rationale, what the rationales actually were that were given. Was it a decision from the hierarchy um, that basically imposed the new style? Was it the result of changes in society in which new styles of music brought in um, with Russian culture were gaining greater popularity? So these are some of the things I'm still trying to figure out from archival sources. What I can say from what I've seen so far is that the disappearance of Georgian singing was not immediate or absolute, particularly outside Tiflis, nor was the entire church hierarchy opposed to this style of music. So one example, um, Exarch Moise is reported to have loved Georgian chant and gathered around himself the best chanters from across the entire exarchate of Georgia and had them sing and it said that he himself would transcribe some of these motives into notes. Um, at the same time, um, other material I've looked at sort of brings in the imperial agenda a little bit more strongly. Um, Russian style singing was prioritized as a means of education and civilization amongst the so-called mountain peoples, um, the people who were not um, already orthodox. Um, so for instance, I, I found a 1839 request from a teacher working in a school for mountain children, um, Diti Gortsov, um, in which the teacher asks to end classes in church singing. Um, and it's clear that this means Russian singing because it's referred to as Notnova Pienia, singing from notes. Um, and he says, you know, it doesn't have any purpose because mountain children simply are not interested. But the request was rejected by the church hierarchy who responded very strongly with a, a note emphasizing that church singing was a key instrument for education of Razavania and Christianization of the local populations, right? So this is another way in which um, church song in its Russian form is seen at this point in time. Um, in addition to imposed change brought on by these questions of hierarchical control, um, the gradual embrace of Russian imperial uh, control by the Georgian nobility also brought with it the trappings of Western style culture, including music. And we can give many examples of this. The first um, opera house was built in Tbilisi in 1845 um, under the, the leadership of Governor General Mikhail Vorontsov. Um, and as Russian culture in the capitals of Moscow and St. Petersburg became more integrated with European musical culture, the urban culture of Tiflis followed suit. So in 1859, the famed concert pianist Anton Rubinstein actually founded the Imperial Russian Music Society in St. Petersburg as a way of um, further developing European style music education in the capital 
models, but this then um, was imported to Tiflis not that long after where a local music school was taken over and a local branch of the Imperial Russian Music Society formed with the same goal of bringing civilized European style classical music to the urban population of Tiflis. Um, and this period um, under uh, Varontsev was also one of expanding education for Georgian nobles um, and greater influence coming from um, Russian circles. So for those uh, noblemen who wish to continue their education past the secondary level, enrollment in Russian universities led to their um, leaving the Caucasus region, enrolling in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and imbibing many of the social ideas that were circulating in Russian circles at that point in time. Um, and some of these were quite radical, such as the um, sort of revolutionary ideas of people like Nikolai Chernyshevsky and Dobre Lubov. Uh, and this new part of educated society uh, came to be called the Terek de Lulni, the, those who drank of the water of the Terek, which meant it refers to the river that separates Georgia from Russia, but it's really this um, emphasis that they are incorporating things that they have learned in their time in Russia and bringing that back to the way that they think about Georgian society. Um, and then, of course, the great reforms of Alexander II further transformed the social structures in Georgia. And it was against this backdrop that the Georgian sacred chant revival gained momentum. So in 1860, Bishop uh, Alexander Akroperidze spearheaded the founding of the Committee for the Restoration of Georgian Liturgical Chant. Um, and he actually paid for this from his own funds. He was a nobleman who had some sort of um, personal income that he could put towards this. Uh, Akroperidze had been trained at the seminaries in Tbilisi and Kazan. Um, and he was interested not just in Georgian chant, but in the preservation and renovation of Georgian historical landmarks, as well as its cultural heritage. And he was responsible for uh, rebuilding a number of monasteries um, and also founding some educational um, initiatives in Georgia. And in 1863, he invited three singers that were knowledgeable in Georgian chant to Sioni Cathedral in Tiflis. Um, and to support their work there, he tried to raise money to pay them from interested members of the congregation. And so you can see he's really starting to build some kind of um, civil society around this um, reclaiming of Georgian tra chant tradition. And this renewed interest in Georgian chant resonated with rising nationalist sentiment in the Georgian language press of the day. Um, for instance, in 1864, the poet David Machabeli mourned that in contrast to an imagined golden age that he, he talked about when knowledgeable and capable chanters were abundant. Quote, today there are no singers of Georgian chant in the entire country who can knowledgeably and thoroughly chant the service. They can't even chant the creed or the Our Father in the correct mode, even though the entire liturgy and every Christian prayer is based on these two, and they are beautiful chants. So you can see how this um, discourse about the loss of Georgian chant gets folded into uh, a rising sort of um, developing national identity. And the Committee for Reviving Chant attracted the support of several notable Ger Georgian nationalists amongst its members, including Ilya Chavchavadze, who happened also to be a Kropiridze's godson, um, and D Dmitry Kipiani, amongst others. Um, and so, over the course of the 70s and into the 1880s, a developed cultural program began to emerge amongst educated Germ Georgians. And we can see more and more um, societies being founded. In 1879, the Society for the Spread of Literacy amongst Georgians was founded. And the first choir that performed Georgian folk songs professionally um, in sort of concert settings was founded in 1885. And the immediately evident sound of polyphony gave music a particularly strong claim as a defining national feature um, and drawing on a tradition in European culture more broadly that viewed music um, in polyphonic form as more inherently developed or civilized than monophonic music. This was actually also a way of asserting the inherent value of Georgian culture. Um, if you've developed a polyphonic tradition, the idea is that this says something about the level of development or civilization of your culture as opposed to a culture that has not um, developed polyphonic singing. Um, but this, this narrative of national awakening and integration does gloss over what was in practice an intensely debated process. Um, the 
question of how you actually define what pure Georgian sacred chant should sound like. Um, and so one of the questions I'm really focusing on in my research right now is exploring the debates around this question of like, what is correct Georgian chant? What should it sound like in both the Georgian and the Russian language periodical press? And there's quite a discussion um, in both of these uh, languages, as well as surviving documents. Um, and these documents tell a much more complicated story. And what I'm going to give you now is just a really short overview of some of the things that I have found. Um, so in 1877, Bishop Okroperidze offered a financial award to anyone who could successfully transcribe Georgian chant into Western notation. And it's worth noting here how important the idea of preservation is and the use of Western or what is sometimes called Russian style notes for preserving Georgian um, tradition. Um, and this ultimately culminated in a chant competition held in Tiflis as a means of comparing the sound of chant traditions from Eastern and Western parts of Georgia with the ostensible goal of identifying which form of chant was most pure and worthy of transcription. So the idea was you would bring all these chanters together, you would figure out what is the best style, and that would become the national um, Georgian chant style. Um, and the uh, East Georgian chant style was represented by the Karbereshvili brothers, um, who you see picture of here from 1878. Well, four chanters were invited from West Georgia to represent their regional styles. Um, and again, there's a lot of background, but I, I will say that personal conflict and disagreements and intrigues surrounding these early transcription efforts were voiced in sometimes a very passionate form, both in the periodical press of the day and in personal writings. Um, um, and so that's sort of an image to get in your head, the East Georgian movement. Um, and then Pilevon Karidza is the fellow who ultimately successfully um, transcribes West Georgian chant tradition, um, who sort of, uh, for our purposes, can represent the other side of the debate. There are many more people involved, but this at least gives you um, two figures to um, bear in mind as I give you some of the, the disagreements. Um, ongoing strife indeed quickly divided the committee over this question of what the correct form of chant should be. Um, after the West Georgian style was selected initially for transcription by uh, Machavariani, who was the Slavonic chant teacher at the Tiflis Seminary, um, Karbelashvili, who was one of the representatives of the East Georgian tradition, was incensed by the claim that he said had been leveled by certain committee members in a meeting that, quote, the chants of Kartli and Kacheti always came from Guria, uh, by which you know, the, the claim is basically that East Georgian chants are just a derivation of West Georgian chants, um, which he's very upset about. And he fumed that, quote, they, the committee members, went even further, claiming that in Kartli Kacheti only service chants are performed and poorly at that, end quote. And then noticing the lack of progress um, after the West Georgian tradition had been selected, um, but no transcriptions were forthcoming. Karbelashvili began to accuse the leadership of the Committee of Georgian Chant Revival of financial mismanagement. So he starts you know, writing all these things about like, where's the money gone? We don't really know what's happening. Um, what are they using it for? Karbelashvili's detractors, meanwhile, critiqued a January 14th, 1883 performance by his students in Sioni Cathedral, claiming that his um, addition of voices beyond the three parts that were considered properly Georgian had sounded Russian in character. And you can start to see how identity is being um, used here in these deba debates. Um, and even when the committee reversed course and requested that the Karbelashvili chants be transcribed alongside the West Georgian chanters, Karbelashvili complained that his, sing his singers did not have time to sit for five hours a day because they had other work to do. Um, and he, he argued um, in a note that he made, quote, there is only one possible answer. They are trying to make me and others abandon the work for chanting, silence me and fulfill their strange wishes, but the truth will out. People who truly want Georgian chant to revive should not be reporting in secret to the government and making them believe there is no more Georgian chant in Kartli and Kacheti. They should not be purposefully slowing down the work, end quote. Um, now, when the initial transcription efforts failed to produce results, the task was turned over in 1883 to Pilimom Koridza, who you see on the screen there, 
who was himself a trained opera singer who had studied in Italy and recently returned to Tiflis. Um, this is all gets very complicated, but according to Kabelishvili, Karidza asked for too much money for his work, which caused the commission members to turn to yet another transcriber, a man named Giuseppe Truffi, who was the conductor at the theater, to do the transcription instead. But this didn't work out either. At a February 1884 meeting of the committee that reviewed transcriptions prepared by Trufi, Karbelishvili attacked what he called Italianisms in the transcription. And that gathering actually ended in an argument with Karbelishvili concluding that not musicians, but the clergy should be the ones tasked with writing chant. Um, and it should be Georgians, not foreigners like Trufi. And this goes on and on. Um, and in 1884, the bishop actually um, commissioned the Russian composer Mikhail Ippolitov Ivanov to um, prepare some transcriptions. Um, and one of the brothers, one of the Kar Karbelishvili brothers, actually decided to travel to Moscow, where he enrolled in the Moscow Conservatory and studied chant notation, so that subsequently um, he was able to prepare his own transcriptions, um, although it's been suggested this was possibly with the help of um, this Moscow composer Mikhail Ippolitov Ivanov. Nonetheless, even though Vasil Karbelashvili should have sort of all the correct identifiers for, you know, providing true Georgian uh, transcriptions, he was not above recriminations for incorporating too many Western aspects into his transcriptions. So for instance, in an 1896 assessment of his work gathering folk songs at the behest of the Society for Spreading Literacy Among Georgians, um, Melito and Balanchivadze critiqued Karbelashvili's use of exaggerated terms like al rigor de tempo maestro, um, so that were unsuitable for the songs themselves. And moreover, he said, why are you using Italian musical terms when you should use Georgian musical terms that, you know, really capture the national um, movement more strongly? Um, while this was all going on with the Karbelashvili brothers, um, Karidza, whose work had been declared too expensive, contacted Bishop Gabriel Kikodze in Kutaisi in West Georgia, um, where the success of his transcriptions was proven through the performance of a mis mixed choir of both Russian and Georgian singers. And again, you can see how the question of identity is being used um, both to justify the effectiveness of a transcription but also to attack it. Um, and as a result of this um, whole thing, a new branch of the Society for the Preservation of Church Chant was founded in Kutaisi. And it was here, rather than in Tiflis, that Koridza and the chanters he worked with carried out their transcription work, um, which became known as the Imeretian style, or the Imeretian Gurian style. Um, so what do we make of all of this debate? Um, I would emphasize first um, the very fact that transcribing an oral tradition into Western or Russian notation was itself a product of the imperial era, right? And a response to concerns about the threat that a changing modernizing society posed to an imagined unified culture of the past. Um, it should also be placed into the larger social context in which it was going on, because you can get very tied into these debates between um, the people doing the transcriptions. But at the same time that the chant revival was happening, Russian style singing continued to be highlighted in Tiflis. And in 1886, for example, the Society of Brotherhood of the Georgian Exarchate initiated a series of popular religious moral readings in Russian, Georgian, Greek, and Tatar languages, so sort of recognizing the multi-ethnic quality of Tiflis. Um, and this included performances by the Exarch's choir and seminarians. Um, but all the songs performed there continued to be a mix of Russian polyphonics, singing from Bortniansky to Tchaikovsky. Um, and it was against this backdrop of national debate versus sort of integrating urban Russian culture that the Russian rector of the Tiflis Spiritual Academy, Pavel Chudetsky, was fatally stabbed in 1886. Um, and in retaliation for this murder, the Exarch of Georgia actually anathematized Georgia and expelled 60 students from the seminary. So these debates about identity um, and sort of the role of forms of um, cultural 
cultural expression had very strong implications um, in social upheaval at the time. Um, and I would then also note that, you know, it's often talked about as this period of uh, repression immediately after, but there is an um, underlying story of continued development. So all these internal conflicts and social strife notwithstanding, um, enthusiasm for George and Chant did continue to grow. Um, and I've seen many examples of this. So in August 1891, um, a fellow, Yosef Monadirov, who was a recent graduate of the Tiflis Seminary, volunteered to teach George and Chant for free at the Telovsky Spiritual Academy. He was the, the teacher of Russian chant, and he said he'd like to also teach Georgian chant. He's founded a Georgian choir. And the next year, they actually requested him not to teach Russian chant, but to teach Georgian chant instead. Um, and in 1897, the Holy Synod in Moscow actually approved teaching Georgian chant at the Tiflis uh, Women's School. Um, and so, Georgian chant writ large, though the purity or um, correctness of one or another form might be debated in um, these circles, was gradually granted more space in churches across the region. And by 1900, um, out of these developments, a teacher at the Talovsky Spiritual Academy was paid 600 rubles a year to teach Georgian chant, um, the same salary that was received by the instructor of Russian chant at that point in time. Um, and by 1904, a commission of teachers of songs from spiritual academies across the Tiflis region were assembled to develop a program for teaching Georgian church singing for spiritual schools and seminaries. And it was the request of the exarch um, that Polyevtkios Korobereshvili actually review and approve this um, Georgian chant collection that was um, approved for use then in 1913. Um, so, what do we make of all of this? Um, my, my comments right now are preliminary, as I said, but I, I think we can highlight a few things. Um, first of all, the Georgian chant, chant tradition built, like many of these chant traditions, uh, chant revivals at the time, on the Herderian idea of the nation. Um, and this is actually expressed quite explicitly. Um, in 1900, there was an article in the Russian language newspaper Kavkaz, that called for the founding of a Society for Lovers of Georgian Church Song um, in Tiflis on the model of similar societies that already existed in Moscow, Riga, and the author wrote, quote, practically all provincial cities in Russia. Um, the author claimed it was an important task to differentiate what was truly Georgian rather than cosmopolitan, both for Georgians and non-Georgians, um, because this is the way that every people in the empire will know who they are and what the difference is from other people. And in conclusion, the author actually quoted one of the activists of the Russian chant revival, M. Lisitsin, who had argued, quote, cosmopolitanism in church music, like life generally, is a tendency that is impossible and undesirable. So you can see how sort of this emphasis on national has become much, much stronger um, than in the early years. By 1916, having witnessed the revolution of 1905 and how the unified demands from the Georgian clergy for the restoration of the autocephalous status of the Georgian church were ignored by the Holy Synod, um, Dmitry Arakashvili, the um, Georgian music, musicologist that I mentioned at the start of the talk, um, actually reversed the logic through which Kompanesky had called for the incorporation of Georgian chant into the Russian Orthodox service. He wrote, quote, Georgian sacred chant will convince even the most notorious opposer of autocephaly of the Georgian church that this sort of church music could only be created by an entirely free, independent church, end quote. Dismissed a century earlier as the bleating of goats, Georgia's polyphonic sacred chant was now held up as an indisputable cultural argument for the essential uh, importance of reclaiming the autocephalous status of the Georgian church. Um, but, and this is my closing thought, perhaps of equal significance is that Arakashvili wrote this claim in Russian with the authority of being one of Imperial Russia's leading music ethnographers. And so here, as in so much of the Georgian chant revival, empire, nation, and belief were all 
um, intertwined in complex ways. Thank you.